to do that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you for being back here with us. Uh, it's been a, we've been away for the month because it's the summer month and uh, poets die off like little fireflies. And uh, so we're back for the first time. Um, I'm very dyslexic, so all my poetry came from word of the mouth, the dream on somebody's breath, uh, uh, songs, poetry, that's how it came to me. So to be speaking poetry is what I do. My sister used to not read poems to me, she'd recite poems to me. And the only text I had was my sister's breath on my cheek. And I'd find the text of what she was saying 40 years later. So that's where it exists for me. I was looking at Tom Waits being introduced, in, in, inducted into the Music Hall of Fame. And he got up and he said in his Tom Waits voice, he said, people said I'm very difficult to work with. <laughs> As if there was something wrong with that. <laughs> and he also said, songs are just very interesting things to be done with air. So, I hope that tonight all you guys are going to do very interesting things with the air. Uh, this bit of air here at the moment is mine. Uh, uh, I will suck it in when I leave, then uh, Ricardo will come up and he'll have his own, you'll have your own Pacific Air, won't you? And your Pacific Gravity and everything, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm going to do <coughs> somebody else's poem, a poem I like very much. Uh, in Cranley, for Remembrance Day, we're going to, we have to read a uh, First World War poet, and we have to read one of our own poems. So I'm going to practice this idea. It's called The Magpies in Piketty, and it's by T.P. Cameron Wilson. Theodore Percival, or Jim, to his friends. <laughs> he nearly made it to his 30th birthday. He was killed in 1918. He's got no known grave. So these words are his. Magpies in Piketty. Oh, the magpies in Piketty are more than I can tell. They flicker down the dusty roads and cast a magic spell. And the men who march through Piccadilly, through Piccadilly to hell. The blackbird flies with panic, the swallow goes with light, the finches move like ladies, the owl floats by at night, a great and flashing magpie that flies as artists might. A magpie in Piccadilly told me secret things of the music in white feathers and the sunlight that sings and dances in deep shadows, he told me with his wings. The hawk is cruel and rigid, it watches from a height. The rook is slow and somber, the robin loves to fight. But the great and flashing magpie, he flies as lovers might. He told me that in Piccadilly an age ago or more. While all his fathers still were eggs, though his dusty highways bore, brown singing soldiers marching out to Piccadilly to war. He said that still true chaos works on the ancient plan, and two things have altered not since first the world began, the beauty of the wild green earth and the bravery of man. But the sparrow flies unheeding and quarrels in his flight, the heron trails his legs behind, the lark goes out of sight, but the great and flashing magpie, he flies as poets. <coughs> That's not shaking to be put into a song. I've only heard this song uh, once, but it was in those sort of semi-operatic voices. Oh, the magpies are picking me up. <laughs> and that uh, doesn't do me at all, in a friend. So, uh, so this is my one. This is called His Wooden Legs Stares At Me. Grandfather Gordon, always scratching his wooden leg, insists it itches. Always a different explanation of how he lost the leg. Enough to fill a book. Grandfather Gordon scratching the air where his legs should be. 
Grandfather Gordon's wooden leg, now a tommy gun, a sword, a unicorn's horn. Give me me leg, you daft wee buggers, <laughs> begging for his leg back. Grandfather Gordon's gone, his wooden leg lives on, dusty in a corner. <laughs> Grandfather Gordon said he wasn't their grandfather. He came back from the war. Uh, some of the children um, were still in the womb, so he came back to all these babies. And he came back minus a leg, minus his mind, and he was all white. And they were very embarrassed by this loss of mental stability, loss of the leg. And they, they said, that's your grandfather. So it was their dad. So it was all his grandfather Gordon. That's what they were told. Now I had to give Jan my, uh, my book. Uh, so I have this sort of very, this is what my poems look like before they're typed out. Uh, this one got thrown away and it got uncreased and flattened out. Now the trouble is, as you can see with that, I don't write in English, I write in scribble and scrawl. And uh, Jan will tell you I've got many poems down by the side of the bed. Oh, and man. if I don't get them out into neat scribble and scrawl, even I can't understand them. And she'll come up the stairs to see me frying, and frying, crying in frustration, going, what the hell did I say there? I know I did a great poem, and that's all I can remember, that I really like the poem, but I can't do it. So this is called The Museum of the Mind. See, the title didn't even get on there. <coughs> Hello, Bobby. The Museum of the Mind. The wrong page. Has anyone seen my memories? She'd ask in a faded voice, worn about the edges. I've lost all of 1963, as if 1963 were something one could lose down the back of a sofa or leave out in the rain. We all knew her, memories of my heart, and so could always replace them if she lost them. We were her prompters, she the great actress floating across whatever stage of her life she chose to be. We drip feather a word or two here and there, and she'd be off, lost somewhere in 1963, as if it were a place one could be at will, if one wanted to be, a cut price holiday destination, a tourist to herself. Did I ever tell you when, she began, and we'd always say, why, no, <laughs> and listen to her again, be a girl of seven, and 1963 was, was hers to hand forever and ever. Hmm. Uh, old poem of mine that I found called Snow Falls. <clears throat> she wakes to a morning with no reason for living, cries in the mirror to be forgiven, puts on her makeup, takes off her clothes, sits there and bleeds until she can't feel the blood in her veins runs cold. The razor bleeds. The cat cries to be fed. The batteries in her Walkman go dead. The Rachmaninoff stops. A letter she will never read drops on the welcome mat. The mobile rings and rings and stops. A member of a minor political party looking for her vote rings the doorbell twice, slips on the ice, and ruins his coat. <laughs> Curses. A man laughs at another man's joke. He's a big laugh, he's, he's a big bloke. Laughter invades the square. There's a chill in the air. A friend calls for her to go on a blind date. She doesn't hear. Snow, snow, snow falls. Thank you.